Thank you very much for the introduction and also uh, the opportunity to speak here. Um, so, right. Um, so this is the title of my talk. So I will attempt to explain what <coughs> each of these things are. So there are three things. One is some physical theory called a, a G.S. Douglas theory and something uh, and the, the remaining things are purely mathematical things. One is called some isomonodromic deformation, and the next thing is called topological recursion. So our attempt to explain what uh, little I understand about these things and how they're related. Um, so the plan of the talk is following. So I'll first say something um, about class S theories. Um, which is some particularly nice um, set of theories in, in physics, which are called 40 n equals 2, which um, it doesn't really matter if you don't know what these means. This kind of, have kind of occurred several times probably in this workshop already, um, most notably yesterday about uh, the thing about Donaldson Thomas invariance. And then I'll say some particular some things about a particular subset of these things called Hedges Douglas. Um, so this is an infinite family of theories, only, I don't know, like two of which are due to Hedges and Douglas. And so this is some subset of these things, some very special subset. And some kind of mysterious or conjectural duality. Between theories within this class, so there's some duality there. Um, so I'll try to say. So that's a purely physically motivated conjecture. I'll say kind of what I believe some mathematical consequences are, and then I'll completely switch gears, seemingly, to talk about some proposal um, of a well, an okay. I don't know. I don't want to say too much. Um, a proposal of a definition of the topological string partition function and this is due to various people. Um, I think Coleman, Pomoni, Teshner and also Komen, Longi, Teshner. So a priori, that's this thing called topological string partition function, which is supposed to count Komen-Fried invariants of arbitrary genus. And a priori, it's just some formal expansion. And this is a proposal by uh, these people, two papers due to these people, which gives some non-perturbative definition, or some proposal at least. Okay, and then finally, I'll talk about um, topological recursion and, okay, maybe I'll number these, one, two, three, four, um, plus how it relates to three and the duality I mentioned in two. Okay, so that's the plan. So hopefully I'll get through most of this. Okay, so let me start with one. So as I said, I want to say something about class S theories. Okay, so... Um, well, so, okay, so as I mentioned, this is some physical theory in four dimensions. And the way it comes up is the following. So there's some very sp special theory, in, which is not in four dimension, but in six dimension. And it's some kind of gauge theory
So for a gauge there, you have to pick some group G, so some gauge group. And for today, you can just think of this gauge group as something like SLN, for some N. OK, some classical group, maybe. OK, so you have some gauge group G. And then what you're allowed to do, because I want to produce some theory in 4D instead, you want to compactify on a Riemann surface. Which I'll denote by sigma. So, OK, so this is denote, I'll denote by, so this, the 6D theory, is, as far as I know, it doesn't really have a name. So uh, some people call it script S, I think. So when you compactify on this sigma, you just write this. OK, so so far I haven't said anything. Um, so what are some examples of this? Um, if you know about cyber witten theory, then, well, these are all examples. Um, what else do I want to say? OK, so what, what's important here is that this, when you do this compactification, it depends. So this compactification depends. Because this is not some purely topological theory, it depends on what sigma is. Rather, it depends on the complex structure uh, of sigma. OK, so you already have some kind of parameters. Um, well, you already have, uh, hmm, how to say, yeah, parameters. Or what physicists like to say, coupling constants. Um, well, these coupling constants are parameterized by which particular surface you pick. So in this case, sigma is just some curve of genus G, so you have to modulize space of curves. So right now, I haven't said anything about um, non-compact curves. So sigma is just some genus G curve, which is compact. But later on, I'll introduce singularities, um, and then this will get more complicated. In fact, yeah, OK. OK, so let me say something else about this theory, and I'll give you an example, which hopefully many people are familiar with already. So at first, I want to say something about this theory. So when, whenever you have some physical theory, you have what's called the moduli space of vacuum. So what is it? So this is just some honest space, which I have to tell you, given the information of sigma and this group G. OK, um, this is also sometimes called Coulomb branch. This thing. So essentially, um, this moduli space is somehow what happens when you look at this theory very classically. So when you, when you look at this gauge theory, you're trying to solve some kind of uh, some kind of differential equations with group G, values in group G, on this space sigma. So this moduli space has something to do with the moduli space of Higgs bundles, which uh, I'll denote by M Higgs. And this is just the moduli space of G Higgs bundles. Again, if you don't know what this is, it doesn't really matter for the purposes of this talk. So a Higgs bundle, for example, if, if G is just a, a general linear group, GLN, this just consists of a vector bundle of rank n and some uh, endomorphism uh, of this bundle. One form. Yeah, one form valued endomorphisms of this bundle. Um, and so that's not, that's not this Coulomb branch. The Coulomb branch is what? This thing lives over, and this is called the Hitchin base. Hitchin base. And this is very, very nice, uh, essentially just vector space. And 
this will show up for us quite a lot. So while this thing, this m hex doesn't really matter, this uh, hitch in base will be quite important. So this is the hitch in base. Right. So I told you that this uh, hex bundle is something uh, as a first, appro first approximation is some vector bundle with some uh, endomorphism valued one form. And from this endomorphism, you can kind of just compute lots of things. So this, this you just think of as some matrix, matrix valued one form, and you can start taking this trace, or maybe the trace of this squared, trace of this cubed, and so on. Um, and the, these things that you produce um, are the Hitchin, uh, are what gives you this map to the Hitchin base. So for the case of SLN, um, oh, okay. There you go. So let me give you an example. So maybe example. In the case G, S S L N, this B is just the direct sum, uh, H0. So this I equals 2 to N, sigma K to the I. OK, so sigma is the surface that I have, and K is just the canonical bundle. OK, so you start with a quadratic differential, which is k tensor squared, and then you go to k tensor 3, and so on, up to this rank of the group, or rather, up to n. OK. Uh, another way to think of this, which is also important, and this is not, ju not just true for SLN, but for any groups, and that b is essentially also um, moduli space of spectral curves. OK, so I think this also came up essentially yesterday. Um, another thing to say is that the dimension, um, OK, so let me make some more remark. So this is also a remark. Uh, the structure of this map is that, first of all, the dimension of M Higgs, first of all, is always even dimensional. Um, and in fact, it's twice the dimension of B. And the map, uh, maybe I'll call this pi, map pi has, um, well, is. It gives M hex a structure of an integral system. Okay, in the sense that this has dimension twice this, and the fibers generically uh, are just um, abelian varieties. Okay, and in fact, abelian variety would just be the Jacobian of whatever spectral curve we're looking at. OK. Um, right. So let me just say some more general things about what you expect from this physical theory. So dt does and this invariance. So again, um, what is expected, okay, so so far I've told you something about the classical moduli space, but not really about anything else about the physical theory. So what else can you expect? Um, well, for, for gamma, uh, okay, so now um, I will somehow, so I have sigma, and I'll denote by sigma tilde this spectral curve that I have given by the, hit, the, uh, the Hitchin base. So this is spectral curve, spectral cover, sigma tilde, and for later use, 
this sigma tilde will also be equipped with a one form. Uh, sigma tilde and q tilde will be some uh, one form on sigma tilde. OK. So you expect the following. So essentially, for, for gamma, which would be some lattice, in the homology of the spectral curve, and any element in here, and a point be in the Hitchin base, you expect to be able to define some numbers. Some numbers, omega gamma. Which you want, you, I mean, or DT invariance. Okay, and what happens is that, well, now you can start varying this point B in the base, and in fact, you can do something more. You know, remember this base B also depends on this complex structure of sigma. So you can vary any of these parameters, and these omega gamma will be piecewise constant, but not always constant. So these will undergo the conservative Sobelman or crossing. More crossing formula, which we again saw yesterday. And of course, okay, so you don't just expect these, you in fact expect uh, even refined Donaldson Thomas invariants and all of these things. So, the one example that's been made sort of rigorous in some sense is when the group is SL2. Um, okay. So, let me say this. So, the most accessible example is G equals SL2. So, in which case, um, B, so I gave this formula earlier, which I'm now going to specialize to n equals 2. It's just a space of quadratic differentials. Quadratic differentials. And secretly, I'm also allowing myself to vary the complex structure of sigma. Um, and you know that, well, mm, so that's a theorem of Pritchard and Smith, maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. That essentially B, um, so I'm going to abuse notation a little bit here, is isomorphic to the space of stability conditions of some explicit well, some explicit category. So there's some quiver with potential, which doesn't really matter uh, for the purpose of this talk. So there's some category, and this, okay, and this, this is some CY3 category. And you can look at the space of stability conditions. And in fact, this, this B, uh, this Hitchin base, when you vary over all sigma, will give you all of the stability conditions. And in fact, it's all, only for punctured curve and only recently hidden. Ah, right. Or close curve, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, of right. course, it's really irrelevant to do to Maybe also, I should say, Fabian Haydn. Maybe we should also remove the discriminant of B. Ah, yeah. It's also the discriminant, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Something like this. So in general, you expect some story which is similar to this, um, except I think you only get some very small piece of the space of stability conditions. So in the case of SL2, it's somehow you see everything just from this Hitchin base and varying the, the uh, complex structure. In the general case, you only see part of it. Okay, what, uh, what else? Um, yes. And moreover, this thing is closely related to some Fukai category 
of some non-compact CY3. This is maybe due to uh, Ivan Smith. So in general, you expect some, some story like this, where, uh, again, you, you have some non-compact CY3, and B will be, uh, will be the, the B model moduli of this CY3. And yeah, so in general, you have this. OK. And finally, I should say, uh, out to a more nice Say, okay, I, I'm, it's not clear to me exactly what, uh, how rigorous this is. So omega gamma can be computed, maybe at least in practice, by something called spectral networks. So I think in the case of SL2, this is literally true. And beyond that, I don't. So maybe in practice. Uh, yeah. OK. Any, Any questions, questions so far? Does this work also for B into discriminant workers? Sorry? Which? This last statement. Uh, Oh, hmm. I'm not sure. Probably not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so now I want to say something about um a special type of these theories called Edges Douglas theories. So in this case, I will actually go to the opposite extreme, where so here, kind of, the thing that was interesting is, well, you can vary the g you can vary the complex structure of the curve, but now I'm just going to specialize to g, g equals zero. So, uh, okay, so I just take the curve to be p one. Okay. So this by itself is not going to be very interesting. Um, but what you can do is, um, so again, you're looking at, let's say, vector bundles of connection on this P1. So by itself, that's not going to be interesting. So you might want to allow some singularities. And I would do this, but allow singularities at just one point. So let's say at a particular point, which is infinity. Okay, it doesn't really matter which point, so I'm just going to pick infinity. And I'm going to specify what the type of singularity is. Um, so, so in fact, there's something more general, but I'll just tell you one main class of examples. Um, so the main examples for today will be called something called the A k minus 1, comma, a, n minus 1 theory. And this, I believe, is due to Dan Xie. OK, so I think maybe when these numbers are very small, like a1, a2, or something, or a1, a3, these theories were originally called edges Douglas theories. But you can just generalize this to any numbers. So what does this mean? Um, so remember, when I st first started talking about class S theory, I said you have like, some gauge group in the picture, and you're looking at some gauge group G, and you're looking at G bundles. So in this case, you'll be looking, this group is, is specified by this Dinkin diagram, AK minus 1. So you're looking at SLK, um, well, SLK Higgs bundles, or SLK connections, let's say. OK, so that kind of makes sense, because you know, I, I told you you have to specify some gauge group, and this, the group is just going to be SLK. 
Now this other part would, will be telling you, well, the, the only thing I have to mention, I have to specify now is um, how irregular this connection is. So this specifies um, the irregularity at infinity. Okay, so again, I'm going to be looking at SLK connections on P1, but I'm going to allow some very, very bad singularity at infinity. Okay, and I'll tell you now what this is. So, okay, um, so, okay, so pick some coordinate Z. And this connection, well, will be given by some, um, some one form valued in the Lie algebra of SLK. So this is going to be what it is. So I explain what all of these numbers are. Okay, so z is a coordinate on my p1, and I want the singularity to be at z equals infinity. Okay, so you can already see when uh, this has some singularity at infinity. Okay, so I'm specifying the, 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 the connection to look like this. So the connection will be d plus this dz. Um, and here, omega is a primitive k root of unity. Okay, so remember this matrix had better be valued in SLK, and these entries, well, this matrix is traceless, so that's okay. Okay. So you're going to specify this irregularity here, and then you can modify it by whatever thing that's less singular at infinity, and these will be the connections. Okay, so again, you're only allowed one singularity at infinity, which will look like this. Okay, so let me make a remark. Um, there also exist theories with other types of Dinkin diagrams. So with a, I don't know, a star replaced by any, well, by also replaced by D or E type thinking diagrams. Okay, they're, they're slightly more difficult to write down, but um, this is kind of the main example. So just a, a little n and j determined by k and big N? Oh yeah, sorry. So Right, thank you. Um, so, so n and yeah, capital N and little n are related by the following. So capital N is just n minus two k plus j, uh, and j will go from zero or to k. Okay. So capital N, mm, right. Um, yeah, so, it, yeah, it'll be clear in, in a second where this comes from. Uh, but essentially, the spectral curve of this um, differential will just be, will have a coefficient z to the n. In the thing. Yeah? I wanted to verify my understanding of the big picture starting from the physics, but if you're about to say that, then I'll wait. No, go, go on. Okay, so you have a theory of class S. For, yeah. You know, this gauge group, like SL, K, I guess, that you fix. Um, you compactify it on P1 and then a bunch of flat dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, there are many different vacua, and one component of the space of vacua is the Coulomb branch. Uh -huh. our, is it, our jurist of this theory is, are different points on the Coulomb branch for this one theory, sorry, for this one compactification, 
and um, I guess is that correct? No, not really. Um, I mean, yeah, a geostochastic will have itself a Coulomb branch. So you should think that like many different connected components of theories and I mean, yeah. Yes, that, that would be a Coulomb branch just entirely consisting of this thing. Okay. Um, so, uh, so there's some conjecture, which is true, okay, I don't know, from physics, physical, physics conjecture. Which says that these th these theories, AK minus one, AN minus one, of just Douglas, can be what's called geometrically engineered. So, uh, theory can be obtained by compactifying. Um, okay, uh, uh, can be, um, I'll just say, by considering some particular threefold. Okay, by and this threefold, I'm going to tell you what it is, and it's going to be um, following so okay so this this threefold will be defined by an equation um, in the variables x1, x2, x3, and x4. So there's one equation. And if you remember from some kind of basic singularity theory, you can, you can somehow find the singularity of a type a, AK minus 1 using some surface singularity. And this is nothing but, um, well, so F AK minus 1 of X pi is just X squared uh, plus y to the k plus 1. Okay, so you have these polynomials for each a, a k, and you just take the sum of these two polynomials with different variables, so x1, x2 here, x3, x4 here. Okay, and this defines for you a hypersurface singularity uh, in three dimensions. Okay, and then you're allowed to deform all of these polynomials as well. And um, so somehow the conjecture is that this theory is essentially um, obtained by considering some threefold, which looks like this. It's really conjecture because for all efficient systems with any groups, any regular things, it's the negative of associated threefold. Yes. And this, this will be this one, I suppose. Yeah. Mm, possibly. I think it's slightly different. but. Yeah, I'm not sure. Same, yeah. yeah, okay. Anyways. Um, anyway, so, so again, you, you take these two polynomials and you deform in any way you want. And now the point is, um, well, these polynomials are just symmetric when you switch k and n. So now that you should expect some duality when you switch k and n here. Okay. Um, so maybe. Okay, so as a consequence of this conjecture, at least, um, so maybe let's say conjectural consequence is that there exists some duality when you just switch these two numbers. So, kind of already, that's kind of surprising because, uh, so for example, if if k is just 
uh, 2, you're looking at SL2 bundles of rank 2 connections with some very deep singularity. And this is telling you, well, that's somehow equivalent to considering rank n connections for uh, yeah, rank n connections with some mild singularity. And, and so all of the things I've said so far about cost test theories, like things you can compute, these numbers should all be the same when you switch k and n. So in particular, whenever you can compute things like spectral networks, they should be the same. And in the case, maybe like A1, A2, you can kind of just explicitly see this. And this is some computation that's uh, done by people, Maru Yoshi, Park, Yan. So you can just look at the Coulomb, look at the Hitchin base and compute the spectral networks either for the SL2 connection or SL3 connections. And you just see them and then they compute the same number. Each base will be the same, yes? Yeah. I think spectral curves will be also the same, it just yeah. transform and Right. Um, okay. But for, the de for the general case of the Dinkin diagram, could you take a pair consisting of two different uh, diagrams? Yes. Yeah. So A and D. Um, yeah. And the same, the same conjectural consequence for. Yeah. Okay. I, I should say not all of those have class S descriptions. Yeah. Um, for example, I think the E type there are no class S uh, description. Okay. Um. Wait, the, the one where you replace the first slot by D or E has class S description. You're saying just the second slot, you maybe have no class S description? Yeah, I, I think I think things of the type A something, D something, or D something A something will have a class S description. With E, I. Yeah, yeah. 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 make the T invariance defined using spectral trees on, on the base of. Kitchen system, not spectral networks. Oh, okay. Some trees in high dimension. Oh. And this is completely inside series base of integrable systems, so it's, it's a bit of tautology, tautology here. Uh -huh. uh, then we have uh, the story about some initial data and so on. Yeah. Oh, right, yes. Yeah, so draw trees on just on the base of Kitchen system. It's uh -huh, uh -huh. the same Ah, yes, and the flow should be, the attractor flow should yeah, be the same. same. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, so, Okay, let me maybe say something. Okay, so let me say something quickly about the spectral curves. So there's a very convenient way to figure out what the spectral curves are in, in this case. So again, I'm gonna look at AK minus one, AN minus one theories. So I told you I, I have to specify this irregular term, and then I'm allowed to deform by less singular things. So if you just look at the spectral curve without perturbing this thing, you're, you're essentially looking at the determinant of this matrix minus x. So you just, uh, okay, so determinant of phi minus x is gonna be the spectral curve, and this it's just uh, x to the k plus z to the n equals zero. Okay, and when you do your perturbation, however you like, you just get some terms, which are kind of mixed terms in the x and z, or maybe lower order terms. So the way to, you can, one way to um, schematically uh, represent this is, well, you have this kind of Houston polygon. And so this entry here will represent the monomial x to the k. This will represent z to the n. And all, all the deformations will be some, somewhere in these uh, integer points. Okay. Um, so you, in fact, you don't get all of them. You have to delete 
because, because you're looking at SLK connections, and not GLK, you have to remove one column. And then you also see that you remove a row. And so, in fact, you see that um, when you exchange K and N, uh, this amounts to exchanging the coordinates X and Z. So essentially, you remember that you have a spectral curve, and it always comes with this um, covering map to your base curve. So for example, in the case of SL2, this will be the 2 to 1 cover. But in this particular case, there'll be some other uh, covering, maybe like sigma prime. And yeah, um, so the spectral curve will stay the same, but the coordinates will be exchanged. So I didn't understand this plot you made. Is a, is a plot of just deformation of your theory? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, when you add random terms here, yeah. so there'll be some maybe polynomials in Z, some random things here, the spectral curve will deform from this thing to some other thing. I see. Yeah. And then you just see when you do the computations, actually kind of fun, um, that you get essentially all of these things. I see. And, and it's still expected that once you deform it, also there's some duality to deform the other theory. So yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, now I think I'm going to switch gears. Okay, since I'm kind of short on time. Ah, okay, great. So, um, okay. So I think I want to just write down one example. So for example, in the case of uh, A1, AN minus one, and you can, for the rest of this talk, you can just focus on this example. The spectral curve will take the form x squared equals z to the n plus uh, yeah. Okay, so again, the, so all of these are just numbers now, u2 from un, uh, sorry, u2 to u capital N. And there'll be no term here just because the matrix is traceless. Okay, so these parameters are in fact not all equal. Um, so, for example, um, so U2, so the parameters U2 up to U. Uh, Mm. Okay, so okay, so I, I apologize for this. So I'm going to specify the case that capital N is even, just for this example that I'm giving. So when capital N is even up to form two n minus four, um, these numbers are determined purely by the singular part, singular at infinity. So essentially, this, this matrix phi will have some purely singular term. And then, so when I say singular, I, I always be talking about at infinity. And when you, take, when you take the determinant of this thing, so you're essentially like multiplying two things together. Um, you'll see that around half of these numbers will only, de will only depend on the singular part. And then the rest will depend on some things which are holomorphic at infinity. Um, so these will play the role of coupling constant. As before, so somehow these are analogous to change in the complex structure of the curve. Um, and, okay, so let me just do the rest of this example. There's one in the middle, which 
is the residue, also called a mass parameter. And then the rest, so from u n to u 2 n minus 4, will be Coulomb branch parameters. So, yeah. Okay, so all that's to say, not all the parameters are kind of the same. Um, so around half of them will kind of uh, play the role of coupling constants. Um, okay. So what am I trying to say? So when you fix the coupling constants, so in other words, these first n minus three uh, entries, the rest of the data of the connection is somehow topological or can be uh, can be expressed topologically. So this is the same in, in this, uh, you know, when we just had a compact curve, um, you, when you have some connection on your curve, like, you know, the, the, uh, the underlying complex structure of the curve is not something topological. Only somehow the monodromy is topological. And so this is analogous to that. And this is parameterized. Whatever is left, so you fix these coupling constants, and whatever data is left is parameterized by some algebraic variety called the character variety. So I think I have to note this by and Betty, which is the character variety. This is completely analogous to the normal character variety of some connection, maybe on, on your compact curve, let's say. Okay, but now you can vary these coupling constants. So you can vary these numbers. And so varying the coupling constants um, and keeping the monodromy the same It's what's called iso isomonodromic deformation. So let me draw a maybe cartoon picture of this. So you have some base uh, of which uh, maybe denote by script C, which is the space of coupling constants. So remember, this is data that's only determined by the irregular stuff in your connection. Okay, and so over this, you, you, you still have your space of connections. So, uh, I don't know, maybe. Hmm. Space of connections. Okay, and if you fix some particular things here, so uh, some little point C, then for every fiber of this, this map, MC is diffeomorphic to a character variety. Um, right, so this is some general Riemann Hilbert correspondence. And so what happens, maybe I'll write it here. So you have some big space, and every fiber is diffeomorphic to this character variety, which just doesn't change. And so this allows you to kind of construct some, uh, I don't know, some nonlinear non connection. Um, like this. Okay, so you start at some point here and you just insist that your monodromy data always stays the same. 
So this is what you have. OK, so now this, this conjecture about the duality can be phrased in terms of this isomorphic problem. So in fact, this predicts that, um, well, you have two isomorphic problems. For example, one for SLK bundles and one for SLN bundles with varying irregularity. And this is telling you that these isomorphic problems should just be the same. Um, Okay, so now I'll go to section three, and this is some proposal of um, uh, Coleman, Coleman, Tashner, and Coleman Longi Tashner. OK, so I don't really have enough time to go into this. So this is a very beautiful proposal of, some, of how you might want to define a topological string partition function that's not just a formal power series. So it goes something like this. So I'll just draw all the things. Um, OK, so again, um, you have some spectral cover like this. And you're going to fix. Um, basis, symplectic basis, A, I, B, I for gamma, which is H1 of this thing, H1 sigma tilde. And what they say is the following. Uh, so I'm going to use both of these boards. So, um, so here's the proposal. So on M Betty, there exists a set of double coordinates xi, xi check. Okay, so remember this M Betty is some holomorphic symplectic uh, manifold, at least, so it has dim even dimension. So um, and a diagram, and a diagram I will draw here. So the diagram looks something like this. So first you have the moduli series of hex bundles, which is just this. Um, and you're going to multiply it by C star. And on C star, you'll have some coordinate h bar. OK? Um, then you consider the space Z, which is the moduli space of h bar connections. OK, so when h bar is 1, this is just literally the space of connections. And when h bar is 0, this is the space of hex bundles. OK, so this somehow interpolates between these things. So they say there's a map here. Mm, maybe, so this is some explicit map. OK, so from this thing, uh, there's a map to the character variety. like this. Um, and then here, there's always a map to the Hitchin base. OK. So a diagram like this, such that. Sorry, do you, do you call it Z because it's related to the twister space of that as a hyperkeller? Yes. OK. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Like the full stuff would be with CP1 and you're like removing the two points corresponding to the yeah. low and the up. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think maybe they actually write it in that stuff. Okay, yeah. um, such that, well, these XIs. So now you can think of f fixing a point uh, in, inside M hex. You get a bunch of functions, which is functions of H bar. So it is H bar here. And you map it all the way here, and then take xi. OK, so you have these function. And asymptotically, this is following uh, ai over h bar, and where ai is the integral of q tilde. So, right, so on the spectral curve, I also have this differential q tilde, which I'm going to integrate over some cycle ai. So, right, so you have coordinates xi and you have coordinates ai, which are just coordinates on the Hitchin base. And they're related in this way as h bar goes to zero. So, first you have this. And so I haven't gotten to a punchline yet. And something called uh, the isomodromic tau function. Tau function, tau um, of xi, xi check, can be expressed in a very simple way. So in fact, there'll be some other function, z. So remember, these xi come in, in pairs. But this, capital fun this function, capital Z, will just depend on half the coordinates. And the rest, you just take a Fourier transform. So something like this. Um, OK, so I haven't told you what this is, although this came up briefly yesterday. So this isomodromy problem is just completely specified by some particular function called the tau function. So it's just some sp special function which tells you how you do this isomorphic deformation. So it's completely mathematically rigorous. And they say that this function will satisfy some special difference equation, which means it can be expressed in this way. And this will essentially be the topological string partition function. Yeah. Yes, I think. <laughs> yes, there should be some equivariance with respect to this, this change of basis. Yeah, but uh, in general, it's going to be quite complicated. I think. Yeah. Might have some relation with data functions, you think, or with? Oh, yeah, is that a big question? Uh, it might have relation with data functions. It definitely has some relation to data function. What that relation is, I don't really know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So did you say that this is a proposed definition of Z? Or yes. Or, okay. So it's, it's not a conjecture you can check, but just a... Well, sort of. I mean, uh, so first you have to, I mean, you have to prove that the tau function somehow satisfies the right difference equation to be, to be able to write it in this form. But that you know, that you know is true, it's a theorem. I'm sorry? You know that that is true, that you can indeed decompose the tau function like that. No, I, this is completely conjectural. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't understand this x, i, some, some, some like cluster coordinates. Yes, so, right, right, right. So uh, the x, i is can be uh, either things like complexify ventral Newton coordinates or fock on trough coordinates. On trough. Um, right, so for different coordinates, you get different functions. But it's even better than that. So these tau should, in fact, glue to be some section of a line bundle, so not just some random function. Um, how much time do we have? I think you're uh, out of time. <laughs> OK, let me say one yeah, thing. Have one, one more thing to say. Yeah, one more thing. I'll just say verbally. So there's some proposal, which is very similar to this in the world of topological recursion, where now, so where, whereas this is 
uh, actually well defined Fourier transform. Um, there's some formal Fourier, well, some heuristic at least, where this, this Z, is just given by some single FG H bar to the 2G minus 2. And these FGs are what you obtain by topological recursion on the spectral curve. And so formally, at least, you do the Fourier transform and you ob obtain this. And now, I guess the punchline is that, well, for you to have this duality, these FGs had better behave well when you, s do, when you switch the coordinates on your spectral curve. So in other words, when you switch X and Z, and that's exactly a theorem of a naught and a junta that says that when you switch X and Z, these FGs just stay the same. Um, so they stay the same, so everything stays the same, and the tau function which governs the isomorphic dramatic deformation would just be the same. Um, but that's just a formal, it's just a heuristic to, to, to make everything rigorous. I think it's going to be a little bit more complicated. And uh, does anyone have a question for Josh? Elba? Can you clarify what is the role of the choice of the synthetic basis? Uh, yes. Um, well, first of all, you, you need to separate them into two sets so you can talk about this Fourier transform. Um, yes. And yeah, I think that that's the main thing. And I mean, yeah, so the, the basis will also give you these. So I, I think the point is that somehow. Uh, The basis will tell you like the growth of these function when h bar goes to zero, and that's determined also by these coordinates a i. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other question? And string partition function will be what function on section line bundle on what? Ah, this will be a function on the Hitchin base, Hitchin base times h bar. Yeah, mm -hmm. and defined for h bar not equal to zero because yeah. Bar, so. Yes. Okay, if there's no more questions, let's thank Josh again.